Chandan Badim, thank you so much for coming on to Reimagining Soviet Georgia. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Thank you. I am a Turkish uh, historian, Ottomanist, working on uh, Ottoman-Russian uh, relations and wars, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries. And uh, uh, I did my... <clears throat> PhD uh, on the Crimean War, which included, uh, as usual, the Caucasus Front as well. And I'm also a researcher on this uh, South Caucasus uh, borderlands. And I am currently a guest researcher uh, in Sweden at Uppsala University. So basically, I'm an Ottomanist historian, and I'm uh, my research is uh, uh, on Ottoman-Russian wars and on the South Caucasus, especially. I was born in uh, Ardahan, in a village of Ardahan, which is, as Georgians know well, uh, a border uh, province of Turkey. Uh, bordering with uh, the Akhaltsikh uh, province of Georgia. And uh, I am, a, as a native of this area, I have been interested in its uh, history since childhood. Uh, in the 70s, I was born in 1970, as I said, I, uh, we were then living in a village, and uh, this village, like uh, other Turkish villages, uh, did not have electricity, uh, whereas the Georgian villages uh, across the border uh, all had electricity. We knew it because, uh, you know, in the evenings you can see the lights uh, if you are on a hilltop or mountaintop. So, uh, that was, uh, as I remember, my first uh, uh, interest in uh, Georgia and Soviet Union in general. I remember I was asking my father why they have electricity and we don't have it. Because uh, at that time, not only our villages, but most villages in Turkey uh, were without electricity. The electrification of villages uh, in Turkey was completed only in the 1980s. Whereas, as I learned later, uh, in Soviet Union or in Soviet Georgia, this process was completed in the 1950s. There was a 30-year difference uh, distance uh, between two uh, countries. And uh, if Turkey, I mean, if Ardahan, my native uh, province, was a periphery of Turkey, on the outskirts of Turkey, then Georgia was uh, uh, geographically uh, on the periphery of the Soviet Union. Uh, so how uh, come that they were more advanced? Uh, so this was a question for my uh, curiosity, and uh, in uh, later years, when I uh, learned Russian, I started 
uh, studying Soviet history. And I started learning Russian on my own uh, when I was in university. Then uh, in uh, 1992, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we had a teacher from uh, Moscow who taught us Russian. And then I uh, spent some years in Kazakhstan. So I uh, came into contact with uh, people from ex-Soviets uh, in Kazakhstan and Georgia, Armenia, Russia, and other, uh, and most of the republics. So I have uh, had an experience talking in Russian to uh, people in all these countries. And I have visited many times the archives in Tiflis, I mean in Tbilisi, and Yerevan, and Moscow, and Petersburg. You, you mentioned this uh, experience of growing up near the Soviet, close to Soviet Georgia, and seeing the electricity and kind of being and taking notice of the fact that Soviet Georgia was in the villages were more developed than these villages that were peripheral of the periphery of Turkey. And I'm curious, like what else in this region that's so close to the Soviet Union, but in, you know, a NATO country in, Tur in Turkey, like how else did you guys in this territory so close to the border, like perceive uh, the Soviet Union, perceive Soviet Georgia, Soviet Armenia, or Soviet Azerbaijan? Like, um, what else did you, was there any trade? Was there any, you know, were people going back and forth across the border at all? Um, do you have any other experiences? Yes, uh, uh, you know, this uh, area, uh, has uh, been uh, a battle arena between uh, the Russian and Ottoman empires. And uh, after the uh, Bolsheviks came to power, uh, in, as you know, uh, uh, in March uh, 1918, they co uh, concluded the Treaty of Brest, which uh, uh, gave back these territories to Turkey. Uh, and in the uh, first decades of the Turkish Republic, uh, there were good relations between Turkey and Soviet Union, which meant that there was uh, trade uh, from uh, Kars. I mean, Ardahan was part of Kars province back then. Uh, that there was trade and uh, uh, more relations, but. Uh, in during Second World War, Turkey, uh, although being uh, uh, juridically neutral, de facto uh, collaborated with Nazi Germany, and then at the end of the war, uh, war uh, Stalin wanted to uh, punish the Turkish government uh, in some way, or and then. Uh, there were territorial demands, and this uh, gave rise to a um, deterioration of relations. And uh, the Cold War atmosphere, beginning uh, with uh, the 1950s in Turkey, or even before, uh, Turkey became a member of NATO in uh, 1952. So uh, the, uh, in the new Cold War atmosphere, uh, the traditional anti-Russian uh, feelings, uh, I mean, historically anti-Russianism in Turkey uh, were combined with anti-communism. So anything that comes from uh, those parts, including Soviet Georgia, was considered uh, dangerous and I, uh, I have an anecdote I heard from my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother told me that during the war years, uh, in their village, there was a family and they had relatives from Akhaltsikh, uh, from villages or from the city, I don't know. Uh, like many others, right? Uh, in uh, Because 
most people in Ardahan region uh, are uh, old immigrants from Akhalsik. They, their family history, their family tradition tells that uh, to me as well. Uh, we came from Akhalsik. Then it's not known, but uh, probably in, I mean, after the uh, 1829 uh, Russo-Turkish War. So most people uh, have relatives in Akhalsik, and although they, after uh, after the foundation of the Republic, uh, the relations uh, were somehow uh, lesser, but still, uh, despite the borders, there were people who crossed the borders uh, illegally to just to visit their relatives. So uh, during the war, uh, a, uh, a family had a relative from uh, the Soviet Georgian side, uh, but their neighbor saw, uh, saw him and uh, informed the gendarmerie. Uh, that they have uh, spies from Soviet Georgia. And my grandmother told me that the gendarmerie came and uh, arrested all the people, including women whose hands were still in dough, right? The, the women were making uh, bread and they, uh, my grandmother vividly told me that uh, they took uh, even her away with uh, her hands still in dough. Uh, so, uh, this means that during Cold War, uh, I mean, even before, uh, even during the war years, Turkey had a policy uh, of uh, de facto uh, anti-Soviet policy, waiting for the result of the war. And if the uh, Nazis uh, had become successful, Turkey would most probably on their side. And uh, since Turkey was keeping a large army, um, one million almost army, uh, and we, most of it was on the Caucasus uh, border, right? Some on the Balkan side and most are on the uh, Caucasus side. So this, uh, of course, worried Soviet authorities. Why is Turkey holding such a big army? Uh, although it's neutral. Uh, so this, but also uh, demands by uh, Georgian nationalism uh, of territories. Uh, I mean, this is, a, of course, a disputable uh, uh, topic, but in any case, without going into details of that uh, debate, I can say that uh, uh, relations were deter uh, were now almost cut, and Turkey, uh, being a NATO member, uh, there were there was no longer, for example, a Soviet consulate in Kars. Uh, so uh, this was also reflected in Turkish historiography. When you read books, uh, and there is uh, one particular professor who has written uh, on this uh, satisfaction and also uh, uh, Republican times, and anything that was related to Russians, uh, whether it is Tsarist Russia or Soviet Russia, I mean, Russia, uh, including Soviet Georgia in the broad sense and uh, was uh, considered as negative, as evil. You know, I'm, uh, this, this actually uh, brings up a question I wanted to ask you. You know, you're a historian who is specializing in, these, in this border region. And it's very interesting because it seems like this is a territory that because of the fact that there are these there are these towns and cities and entire provinces which have been controlled by different forces in you know such a short amount of time over the course of a couple of hundred years that the nationalist historiographies 
are probably going to be very different and have very strong, you know, orientations about how the history happened. And so I'm curious, how do you navigate when you're trying to understand something like what happened to cars or maybe the history of Batumi or Ajara or the histories of some of these territories? How do you navigate the competing nationalist historiographies, the Turkish, the Armenian, the Georgian, maybe even Azeri in some cases, like uh, Russian. How do you navigate and parcel through these very strong nationalist historiographies? British. And British even, for sure. German. German, European historians, no, for sure. Yeah, yeah, you can even add the Kurdish uh, historiography. Yeah, even uh, Kurdish nationalism uh, is including these days uh, uh, Ardahan, uh, and uh, they also, uh, I mean, there are Kurds, of course, in Kars and Ardahan, and uh, uh, even Kurdish nationalism, which is the, you know, youngest one, and uh, they also uh, try, uh, write a new uh, nationalist um, uh, history uh, of the region. Well, uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, so I, uh, it's one thing that I had to struggle against uh, in all my uh, work uh, because uh, when I studied uh, books uh, in, the, uh, in these languages, I mean, I don't know Georgian, but uh, I uh, studied works in English, Russian, Turkish, Kurdish, and Armenian. Uh, so uh, it is one thing was clear that uh, since this was a borderland, uh, the uh, most nationalist historians uh, had the uh, urge to uh, prove that uh, this area was uh, de uh, their nation's area. It belonged to, from, an, from ancient times, it belonged to them and so on. Uh, when you uh, look, for example, at uh, Turkish nationalism, it says uh, even before medieval times, this area was uh, habitated by Turks. And uh, Turkish nationalism is uh, so assimilative that it uh, even tried to assimilate the last people, for example, Hamshins, Kurds, even Georgians, uh, by some accounts, uh, appear to be Turks, right? Such uh, absurd uh, claims. Uh, and uh, North Caucasian peoples like ours also appear to be Turks. And uh, I mean, you see this not in some populist writers' works, but in the works of a uh, historian with the title of professor, right? And uh, these nationalists, Turkish nationalists also have uh, their uh, folk etymologies, again, absurd etymologies, like, uh, for example, Akhalsik, right? It is a word in Georgian, Akhalsik, which means new castle, right? Or new city. And uh, it is very clear that it's a Georgian uh, topographic name. But uh, these Turkish nationalists uh, wanted to explain it in Turkish, uh, claim that it's also a Turkish uh, word. And uh, again, there are uh, many village names in the area, which uh, obviously sound to be Georgian. I mean, uh, the place names are uh, very complicated. Some of them appear to be from Urartu uh, language, uh, from uh, languages that are, you know, prehistoric even. And, uh, but uh, the Turkish nationalists try to uh, explain them all as Turkish names, uh, which is ridiculous because uh, they are so obviously not Turkish. Some of them Georgian, some of them maybe we don't know which language, but obviously not Turkish. And so there was a time in Turkey in the 60s to Turkify all village names, and uh, including the village in which I was born. For example, its name was Vardosan, 
And uh, I mean, any nationalist can claim that it's in their language, Turkish, Georgian, Armenian, Kurdish, whatever. Uh, but in reality, it might be none of them, that it might be an Urartu name or whatever. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure, you know. But I don't have an agenda to prove that it is Turkish, right, or whatever. Uh, but these nationalist historians all have such uh, agendas, first to prove that this area is theirs, and then to prove that uh, population statistics uh, support their claims. So uh, when you look at nation nationalist historiographies, they, they always try to uh, falsify population statistics, uh, like Tsarist Russian population statistics. Uh, and sometimes they do it in a gross way, uh, apparently uh, giving reference to some source, but then uh, writing things that that source doesn't say, you know, like uh, uh, very uh, uh, obviously falsifying uh, their sources. So such methods, of course, uh, uh, made me cautious on all types of uh, nationalism. And I also noticed that uh, due to the Cold War climate, uh, no one in Turkey had done research in Russian archives, in Georgian archives, I mean, in Soviet archives. I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that, you know, um, how this, because you mentioned that there was this, ain't this like long standing, maybe holdover from the Ottoman era, uh, hostility in Turkey towards Russia that became kind of like an anti-Soviet, anti-communist uh, uh, orientation. And I'm actually just curious, like, during the Cold War, what was the anti-communist, um, anti-communism like in Turkey? How did it manifest, you know, in what ways was it in a part of the political culture in Turkey? Well, for example, the uh, Russians were called Moskov, you know, the traditional uh, uh, insulting word, or uh, let's say, uh, diminutive or I mean not uh, in a sympathetic way of course so uh, for uh, in the official uh, parlance in official uh, propaganda uh, Moscow was the symbolization of evil although Georgians were not seen as an uh, enemy uh, because uh, there are Georgians in Turkey as well there are Muslim Georgians and historically uh, Georgians are not seen as enemy in Turkey, but uh, since they were part of this evil empire, uh, they were also uh, seen as an enemy. And uh, some Georgian writers in Turkey who just tried to uh, revive their culture, use their language, uh, were repressed. Some were killed even. Uh, so there were repressions against all uh, non-Turks in Turkey and some uh, local Turkish Georgians also uh, were uh, affected by this. And uh, learning Russian even was a suspicious activity. I apologize. When was the, the repression of languages? That was also Georgians for what years? All the uh, Republican years, I mean, starting from 1923, when the Turkish Republic was founded, until recently, uh, I mean, even today, there are uh, uh, some restrictions and uh, pressures. Uh, there, the official policy in Turkey was uh, uh, that everyone was a Turk, every citizen was a Turk, and no... Uh, no one was given the opportunity to, uh, for example, study uh, to get education in their mother tongue. Uh, Kurds were considered mountain Turks. And Georgians, since they were Muslims, they were also considered Turks who had uh, somehow 
learned the Georgian language, uh, you know, uh, and this area, Ardahan, Artvin, Kars, you know, has uh, many Georgian names and uh, these place names uh, were Turkified. And, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, just the fun, uh, fun fact, even uh, place names uh, which were Turkish, but which included words like uh, kilise, church, right? Uh, for example, there is a there was a village uh, Ora Kilise, which means uh, Ora. I guess is uh, Ori Ora is three in uh, Georgian, so it's uh, two. Yeah, it's two. Uh, it must be so. It's uh, two uh, two churches, right? Uh, but then. Uh, since it in, uh, includes uh, the word church, uh, its name was changed. And then uh, another village name, just uh, including uh, uh, the word red in Turkish. Although it was Turkish, red meant uh, communist. So they even changed that, uh, that place name. Uh, so, uh, Cold War mentality uh, was uh, such that even the word red in a place name uh, would be considered as communistic, which, I mean, historically, uh, in that case, uh, it uh, had nothing to do with communism, right? It just had a red uh, bill. And then, and then what, what about, so, you know, you, you've spoken a lot about the way that um you know georgians and soviet georgia is kind of understood what about uh soviet azeris who are seen to, who they today use this um kind of you know narrative of being you know uh two countries one nation these you know we are also turks or whatever you know how did the azeris fit into this kind of anti-communist uh turkish imagination well, Azeris, of course, were considered as brothers in Turkey, uh, since they are Turkic and since they are uh, Muslim. Uh, so, uh, Azeris were not uh, subject to such repressions. And in any case, since their language is uh, almost uh, the same as uh, Anatolian Turkish, uh, they did not have uh, identity problems. Uh, there are, for example, Karapapak and Terekeme uh, people who are also uh, Turkic and just uh, some tribal uh, names, uh, but they have some somewhat uh, distinct culture in our area. Uh, so they were not affected. What was the main criticism? Like, what was the anti-communism? Like, what what did they say? Why was communism bad? I mean, anti-communism took so many forms. It was so gross. Uh, it would uh, say that communists do not have morality, for example. They would tell you that communists can marry their mothers, their sisters, even such, you know, uh, indecent words uh, they would use. Uh, they would characterize communism uh, as the, you know, unspeakable evil. Uh, they have everything in common. They they have their wives in common, for example. Such uh, uh, such words. I mean, uh, anti-communism in Turkey, and they also, of course, uh, the strong motive of anti-communism in Turkey was that uh, communists were taking orders from Moscow. They were lackeys of the Moscow, right? Uh, so, uh, yeah, the Turkish communists uh, uh, had this problem of uh, being uh, a, uh, seen as agents of uh, uh, Moscow, while in fact, uh, most uh, communists in Turkey were critical of Soviet Union, by the way, I mean, uh, is some part of the left even considered as social imperialist country? The Maoist, for example, uh, uh, were very critical of the Soviet Union. And some considered it as a revisionist country, which had uh, uh, gone away from Marxism, Leninism. So although the left, I mean, the communists in Turkey, 
uh, not the only, um, I mean, uh, communist parties in general. There was the official communist party recognized by uh, Moscow and illegal. Uh, communism was officially, by the way, uh, uh, banned. According to law, you you could not set up a party with the name of communist. The Turkish uh, constitution or uh, penal code had an uh, article which said uh, setting up parties on the basis of class is prohibited. So communism was officially prohibited in Turkey. I mean, and people uh, got so many sentences for publishing works of Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin. Uh, although in time, these barriers were overcome, but uh, in the 60s and 70s, publishing uh, such Marxist uh, classics was prohibited uh, or was always uh, subject to some repressive uh, sanction action uh, by the state. And what is um, what was the most, I guess, curious thing when you were researching the Soviet Union and attending archives? And what was it that you were learning? What was your main focus? And also, what are the unexpected things that you found that kind of were like? It's interesting for me just to hear the fact that uh, you know Turkish villages didn't have electricity. I mean, that's an incredible point, you know, to think that. Um, and so like, even though, cause right now it, Turkey's looked upon as much more industrialized and much more advanced than Georgia is right. Georgians go to Turkey to work there and to Istanbul, especially. So it's a very different kind of, um, relationship. Yeah. To think that Unfortunately, how Georgia was more developed at one point because of yeah, the yeah. union is like it's mm -hmm. a little hard to imagine almost, you know. Yeah, yeah, I can I can imagine. I mean, if you were to ask a Georgian youth uh, for today uh, in streets of Tbilisi, uh, they wouldn't probably believe that Georgia was once uh, more industrialized, more developed than Turkey. Uh, I mean, that might be, but. Uh, uh, I mean, facts are stubborn things, as the English say. Uh, uh, Ardahan did not have a single factory, but uh, Akhalsik, the uh, you know comparable city right across the border, had a factory, had more than one factory, and there were thousands of factory workers in Akhalsik, even in a small town like Akhalsik, had uh, factories and uh, uh, workers. And uh, whereas Ardahan was totally rural, right? It was only villages, and even those villages did not have electricity, did not have a uh, tractor, right? I remember in my village, only one family had one tractor in the year 1980. So by 1980, our village had not see seen a single tractor. Whereas we knew that the Georgian villages had their tractors, had other uh, agricultural instruments. And, uh, uh, for example, uh, agricultural instruments uh, from Soviet Union were valued for their quality. I don't know how they got, uh, were they uh, smuggled or were uh, not, but uh, they were valued. So if you look at uh, historical facts, Soviet Georgia was much more advanced uh, than uh, at least the eastern part of uh, Turkey or in general, or Turkey in general. But uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, unfortunately, Soviet Georgia also uh, took uh, uh, its I share mean, of course, this destruction. Akhal Tsikhe was looking at Turkey for the lights. <laughs> it was a reverse situation <laughs> after 19. Yeah, yeah. I know in the 90s, uh, I uh, I was told this in Yerevan that uh, people had uh, were sitting without electricity and the city's central heating system uh, was not working and so on. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union has brought so much misery to people. And uh, I have uh, talked to many Georgians in Russian. Uh, for example, I always... Uh, used to talk to taxi drivers, right? In Tbilisi, Yerevan, everywhere, because taxi drivers 
uh, were in some cases former factory directors. Uh, as you know, anybody can become a taxi driver or could become at that time. Uh, so they, I would ask them, uh, are you living better now or was it better in Soviet times? And in most cases, they would tell me they lived better in Soviet times. I remember especially the words of a Georgian man in Tbilisi. Uh, he told me that they lived in uh, paradise uh, during the Soviet times. Uh, I, I never forget those words. He, he told me we used to go to Moscow on uh, airplane by air to have lunch there and then would return in the evening. Uh, and we did this we just as ordinary people. Uh, and he also said we had more uh, goods in uh, our shops uh, and mosque, which uh, people from Moscow would come to us. So, uh, yeah, I have these uh, anecdotal experiences uh, from uh, Georgia and Armenia and Russia as well. I believe that uh, in socialism, uh, of course, there were problems, but people uh, absolutely lived better. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, how did you get interested in socialist politics? Besides the lights, because that's besides, a pretty Yeah, good besides, besides yeah. the electricity. You know, that's clear, like, yeah, they got lights there, we're dark here. But it's I, like, they're watching TV, <laughs> I want to watch TV. But I mean, like, you know, it's really interesting as someone is, you know, who's coming of age in the towards the end of the Cold War uh, in rural Turkey, you know, how did you find or become... You know, find uh, Marxist politics or get interested in them, and uh, and then I guess the question would be: being on the other side of the border of the Soviet Union, what did the Soviet Union's collapse mean to your village, to you personally, and to your political understandings? Yeah. Well, uh, when the Soviet Union col collapsed, I was no longer in my village. I was a university student in Istanbul, so I was uh, urban at that time, and. Uh, it came in an interesting time, just uh, at the time when I was reading Marxist literature and uh, becoming a Marxist, uh, the collapse came as a big shock. And uh, we, of course, started questioning uh, the reasons and uh, why uh, it happened. Was it uh, uh, socialism at all? And at first I was also very critical of uh, the Soviet experience. But uh, later when I started uh, reading documents in Russian, I came to realize that uh, despite all this, uh, all such problems, the Soviet Union was materially uh, better and the new uh, market economy did not bring uh, prosperity or uh, freedom to ex-Soviet peoples. Uh, well, uh, I had my doubts, but let's say uh, that the winds of history uh, have blown away those doubts from me. Uh, because uh, when you read more, you become more informed, but you also realize that you still have to know more, but now you, you understand that uh, the new anti-communist propaganda, anti-Soviet propaganda, uh, is not telling us the truth. I mean, uh, in academics, I believe in uh, in uh, United States, in Europe, uh, have uh, uh, new research, and there are good works, but still, uh, most of them have an anti-Soviet bias. You. And this is understandable because if you write without bias about the Soviet Union, it is very unlikely that you will get a job in a Western university. I don't believe that uh, uh, all academics have the freedom uh, to speak up their minds when it comes to the Soviet Union, because the, the new neoliberal uh, consensus 
uh, like an invisible hand of the market directs people to uh, do research only uh, with an anti-Soviet agenda. And uh, if you have, if your findings do, do not support such agenda, you have difficulty in publish, getting published and uh, most probably, uh, most uh, definitely uh, you will have difficulty in getting a job. So, yeah, I I am suspicious of uh, Western historiography. Although, I mean, uh, that doesn't mean individually everyone is b uh, bad. I, there are very uh, serious studies. I do respect uh, some individual historians, their work, but I'm suspicious in general. And I'm, of course, also critical of the Soviet historiography. Uh, I mean, I did research on the Crimean War, uh, which was uh, a war among Russia on the one hand and uh, Ottomans and uh, British and France on the other hand. And I also did research on the Kars and Batum Oblast under Russian rule. That was the period from 1878 to 1918, right? The 40 year period, which in our nationalist historiography figures as 40 years of black days. And uh, my findings showed me that even Tsarist Russian administration was uh, uh, a better, I mean, more rational and more modern administration than the Ottomans. Uh, so uh, I had to uh, show the uh, lies and uh, unsubstantiated claims of Turkish national historiography about Tsarist Russia as well, not only Soviet uh, Union, but Tsarist Russia was also uh, given only in negative light. Uh, of course, Tsarist Russia was, a, you know, imperialist empire and so on. I, uh, but then uh, there is, if you make a comparison, uh, then you see uh, the people. Uh, in uh, in my area, uh, had better opportunities. Uh, I mean, had the, uh, for example, paid less taxes and were exempt from uh, military service, and uh, there was a better bureaucracy. Of course, it was also corrupt, and uh, there was also uh, inefficiency in Russian bureaucracy, but in comparison to uh, the Ottoman uh, bureaucracy, it was uh, better. I mean, my findings uh, showed me, and uh, it also showed me that uh, the uh, emigration from this area uh, towards Anatolia uh, was not uh, forced, was not initiated by the Russian authorities. The local uh, ulema, local Turkish Muslim uh, community leaders led the people, uh, urged the people to emigrate uh, because they did not want to live under the Russian administration. But then uh, more than a hundred thousand people uh, migrated, but half of them could not find uh, uh, in, uh, good conditions in Anatolia, and they had to go back. So they suffered because of this uh, Muslim ulema, these uh, religious uh, leaders, uh, led people to more misery. I mean, that was one finding uh, of my research. Being a left-wing historian who's trying to navigate this very multicultural border, border area uh, and coming from Turkey, how did you navigate and approach uh, 
Armenians, the Armenian question, um, both the Armenian genocide and also just, you know, the role of Armenians, uh, the, the, the view of them during the Soviet period from the Turkish perspective, I'm also interested in. Yes, good question. I mean, uh, when I visited the Armenian archives in Yerevan in uh, uh, 2009, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I... Uh, I was one of the two uh, historians from Turkey who uh, had ever visited that archive. And uh, most people uh, thought that I was doing research on the genocide because for them it was the most important issue. Whereas I was doing research uh, on the uh, Kars Oblast, right, under Russian rule, because the archives of uh, archives that are related to cars are divided between uh, Georgia, Armenia, and uh, well, also Russia, of course. So uh, at first, I was uh, not interested in the Armenian genocide as uh, such, but then uh, since I was asked uh, so many times uh, about uh, the genocide. I had to study it, and uh, at first I did not have an opinion uh, because I didn't know it, but uh, after my studies, I also came to uh, uh, understand uh, it as a genocide. And my research, uh, for example, on Ardahan uh, during the World, First World War, also showed that Armen local Armenians in Artvin, Ardanuch, and Ardahan, and in the villages, uh, also suffered from Ottoman Turkish uh, bands, uh, which were organized by the Ottoman Special Organization. Uh, so uh, I saw that e even before the start of the uh, genocide in uh, April 1915, there were genocidal killings in uh, in the area. Since the area was under Russian administration, the Armenians in general were not subject to uh, genocide. But during the short period when Turkish uh, troops and irregular bands uh, entered Artvin and Ardahan, uh, Armenians who could not uh, escape from those places suffered. They were massacred. Uh, so, uh, I mean, but this is just one uh, uh, small area of the genocide. So I had to do research uh, on it more extensively. And uh, yeah, I came to realize that uh, Armenians were uh, Ottoman Armenians uh, were subject to genocide, whereas, uh, I mean, the Ottoman or Turkish official line says that Armenians participated in the Russian army and fought against the Ottomans, uh, well, which is true, but this uh, just uh, the existence of uh, some Armenian voluntary uh, bands in the Russian army, of course, uh, does not uh, change the whole picture. And the whole picture says that uh, almost all Ottoman Armenians, with the exception of uh, Istanbul, uh, were deported, uh, I mean, were relocated to the Syrian uh, deserts. And uh, even if uh, they, uh, if they weren't killed on the road, most of them died on the road. Uh, since the state did not take any uh, measures to uh, get, make them live, you know, the, in the desert, uh, they that that means they were meant to be uh, annihilated. Because if you, if your intention is just to, to relocate people. Right uh, during the war time, then you should provide uh, with minimum conditions. The, 
but the state did not provide those conditions. So I believe it, it was a genocide. And uh, yeah, this is also uh, one of the reasons of my being uh, expelled from all Turkish universities at, pre uh, I mean, since 2016. Yeah, I wanted to ask, can you just speak a little bit about, you know, what kind of political repression are you facing as a historian in Turkey? Uh, I, as a historian uh, and as a, an academic, uh, am one of the uh, one of those uh, Turkish academics who have been uh, purged from universities by uh, government decrees, uh, by uh, uh, state of emergency decrees, having the power of law. Uh, so, uh, after this coup d'état attempt in uh, 2016. Uh, Erdogan uh, uh, took advantage of the situation and uh, started uh, purging anyone whom he didn't like. And uh, we ended up uh, being called terrorists. And uh, if you simply do not agree with the official line in Turkey, you can easily be a terrorist. I mean, they don't even bother to show what kind of terrorist activity you, you were engaged in or which terrorist organization you were part of. Uh, they simply uh, call you terrorist without uh, any evidence, without uh, any trial or procedure. And uh, so thousands of people uh, have been purged. And uh, for four years, they did not give my passport as well. So I was unable to go to visit Georgian archives anymore. And then I finally, they gave my passport. So I, uh, I am uh, abroad now uh, because I cannot work in Turkey. Uh, they don't allow me to work in Turkish universities. You know, given the fact that you know, you're facing this political repression, you're a historian, you come from the left. Like, what do you think is the role of history or the importance of history today, especially in this part of the world? Like, why, what, what should historians be doing? And what is the, you know, the political importance of, of, of history? Yeah, history is, of course, uh, a very politicized discipline. And, uh, uh, in Turkey, for example, uh, most historians are uh, Turkish nationalists and Islamists. And uh, if you are not a Turkish nationalist or Islamist, it is difficult to uh, get a position, especially in uh, provincial universities. Uh, but I believe that my identity as a historian and uh, as a uh, as someone uh, who is uh, inevitably involved in politics, uh, are uh, two different identities. As a historian, I uh, I use the historical materialist uh, approach, but I do not uh, have a, a preconceived research agendas. I do not try to prove any nationalist claims. I try to understand what happened in history. And uh, uh, I mean, as I said, I'm critical of both nationalist historiographies and the Soviet historiography as well, because the Soviet historiography was also partly nationalist, because under the disguise of Marxism, uh, people, uh, historians were uh, were rather uh, following their nationalist agendas, their uh, aims. And uh, this was uh, seen when the Soviet Union collapsed, those former Marxist historians uh, became ardent nationalists. And these days, the uh, profession of history uh, in ex-Soviet countries is in a very uh, difficult situation, especially, for example, Armenian and Azerbaijan historians uh, are uh, 
uh, arguing against each other in very, you know, uh, unscientific uh, ways. Uh, they are denying the existence of each other uh, as a nation. Even yeah, that's uh, it has uh, attained such gross dimensions. And yeah, so as a historian, I'm uh, I'm using uh, historical materialist uh, methods and uh, trying to be critical towards all states, all nationalisms, because I believe that they all distort reality, and uh, reality is. Uh, somewhere uh, beyond these uh, constructions of the past. I mean, uh, of course, we uh, cannot uh, construct that past uh, in its full form, but still we can and we should try to, yeah, we should try at least, yes. I mean, I have at least tried and uh, uh, at least I have uh, used uh, sources which were unknown in Turkish historiography. At least I'm proud of, uh, you know, introducing such sources into Turkish historiography, even if, uh, you know, the official line still uh, uh, is uh, different. But I think I have uh, uh, introduced some novelty into Turkish historiography. Yeah. Um, I'm sh I'm sure you have. That's that's actually a really worthwhile pursuit, and you know one of the things that we try to do through imagining Soviet Georgia is to you know reimagine certain history of Soviet Union that's completely lost. Soviet Georgia, is particularly, that's completely lost nowadays, which every single Soviet study is always about repression or some kind of anti-communist. Uh, or even like events may not even be anti-communist, but it will be painted as sort of an anti-communist uh, event. So we attempt to at least show a different perspective and also the multifaceted, faceted, um, you know, convoluted history that exists where things can be both good and bad. You know, we can have contradictory even opinions at this in the same head, you know, about certain things. I know I do often. Um, and it's also very difficult because we do get charged with being, um, you know, called Stalinists or whatever. We get we get called all these like names mm -hmm. all the time, and every time there is, uh, you know, any kind of attempt to guard the truth or expose it or put it in context, which I feel like is the the Western historians have the hardest time doing, which is like. There's a whole context, you know, of of history, and the only country that's ever put on trial is the Soviet Union about everything. You know, it's all well, also Germany fascism, but you know, that's like such a small event, and so it's like very difficult to and to ever get to the truth when any conversation you could be like, I like the metro, you know, the subway, and they'll be like oh, but, you know, Stalin killed millions of people. You know, it's like you can't <laughs> literally have a conversation. You can't admire anything without yeah. them saying. It's like, well, go go take a walk in Brussels and say how you like the architecture, you know, and then I'll say that it's like, you know, millions of, of Africans have died for that. You know, like I can say that about a lot of things, but of course that never exists. Those, you know, rhetorics mm -hmm. only work here because that's it's constantly reified and, Every time mm -hmm. anybody says anything, it's always brought up, which is never brought up or very far left ever brings it up when it comes to Western imperialism or even like, you know, Turkish and, and so on. So, um, you know, and Turkey being part of NATO has always been complicated thing as well with what, what kind of reactionary role it's played in Soviet Union in this part of the world. Um, anyway, so these things are never really discussed uh, or they're discussed in a certain way that's doesn't get us closer to the truth. So that's why I think it's important uh, to always have. And we actually have to start asking these questions more when we have historians on or people who are researchers. We hope to inspire people to also research different things about the Soviet Union, Soviet Georgia. And so maybe you could also advise them since you're somebody who's 
been punished already for researching and trying to mm-hmm. find the truth, which you already partly have done, but maybe like words of encouragement for those listening. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, I understand. It's difficult for historians in uh, Turkey and in uh, ex-Soviet countries to uh, engage really in uh, proper historical research uh, because I believe that the new ruling class that uh, has captured uh, enormous wealth in all these uh, ex-Soviet countries wants uh, to make people believe that even if we have uh, economic difficulties now, the Soviet was the Soviet past was bad because people uh, did not have freedom, pe- because people uh, always lived in terror, and that is why they always, uh, I mean, they make uh, continuous anti-Soviet propaganda. Of course, the Soviet uh, time period uh, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, not uh, uh, like uh, everything in uh, in a rosy uh, color. Uh, of course, there were problems, and of course, uh, there were many shortcomings, and uh, we should be able to, you know, uh, evaluate them critically. But the thing is, this new ide- ruling ideology uh, is not interested in. Uh, you know, uh, knowing in understanding the past, they only care to uh, to uh, slander it, to, you know, uh, label it, uh, label it as evil. Uh, and uh, because they cannot offer, I mean, it has been more than 30 years, right? Uh, since the collapse of Soviet Union, it has been almost 30 years, right? And, uh, uh, the new capitalist ideology did not bring what they promised to the peoples of uh, ex-Soviets. Everywhere people uh, are having uh, more problems now and they uh, now have to uh, vilify the past because uh, their present Wealth depends on it. That's how I understand. There was one specific historical thing I wanted to ask you. Um, yes. Before, yeah, yeah. I was curious. Um, as far as I know, like you know, the when the Georgian Democratic Republic, uh, when Georgia was declared independent and controlled by Mensheviks, that there were certain claims that were Turkish. Um, that then eventually got controlled by the Georgian Democratic Republic forces. Um, and I believe there are certain towns that are now in Turkey that were once, you know, uh, controlled by the Menshevik forces. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about these Georgian claims in what is now Turkey and how the that affected um, specifically Ottoman independent Georgian relations in the a, after World War One. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, after the war, uh, when Bolsheviks took power uh, in uh, Moscow and Petersburg, uh, the Caucasus uh, uh, did not accept Bolshevik or Soviet power, right? So uh, in Tiflis, uh, Georgian, Armenian, and Azerbaijani nationalists uh, had uh, problems among themselves, but they had one thing in common. They were anti-Bolshevik. They all wanted to control their own uh, territory and to uh, enter into relations with imperialist forces. For example, Menshevik Georgia had relations with Germany. Azerbaijan had relations with Ottoman imperialism. And Armenian nationalists relied on British and uh, French imperialism, right? And, uh, but they were all, I mean, to say the least, uh, they were naive, right? Just, uh, they did not have a realistic 
understanding of their situation. I mean, if you are a small state uh, and uh, the Ottomans, although, I mean, uh, were not a big imperialist power, but still it, Ottoman Empire was a big power uh, in relation to them. And so uh, they, uh, without help of Russia, I mean, whatever Russia is not important, uh, they could not have uh, succeeded, but they tried to do uh, diplomacy on their own. And each of them, I mean, except for uh, Azerbaijan probably, but even Azerbaijan suffered from Ottoman imperialism because uh, even Azerbaijan was not recognized by the Ottoman Empire, uh, by uh, the rulers then. They did not recognize the independence of uh, Azerbaijan because they thought of uh, invading it. And Georgia, as for Georgia, the Menshevik leaders uh, lost Batum, for example. It was only uh, by the help of the Red Army, by the help of Soviet Russia, that they took back uh, Batum area, right? And uh, as for Armenians, uh, they had lost even Gumri, right? Uh, today's uh, Gumri, uh, uh, they had lost even it in their wars against uh, uh, Kemalist Turkey, and only with the help of uh, Soviet Russia, they uh, gained back uh, it. Uh, well, I mean, uh, but there was one problem due to their uh, anti-Bolshevik orientation. The Bolsheviks uh, had to ally themselves with Kemalist Turkey. So. Uh, but this, uh, I mean, this is uh, how, uh, you know, nationalists uh, accuse Bolshevik Russia, but, uh, but they are silent on uh, their own, uh, you know, collaboration with uh, the enemies of the Bolsheviks, right? So what are you expecting if you uh, are uh, uh, anti-Bolshevik? Then uh, what? How should what should the Bolsheviks do? Uh, they uh, also allied themselves with uh, Kemalist Turkey, and uh, uh, so an optimal uh, uh, solution. Uh, a solution was uh, at that time the uh, the only attainable solution was uh, uh, attained in the treaties of. Kars and Moscow in uh, 1921. So uh, I believe that these nationalist powers in Tbilisi, Yerevan, and Baku uh, uh, did not have a realistic uh, evaluation of uh, their powers. And uh, if it were not for Soviet Russia, uh, they would uh, suffer more. Wonder really fascinating things that happened when the Bolsheviks came to power is them leaking all these diplomatic things that were that the U Europeans were covering up like the the Sykes-Picot agreement you know like they that was like um secret and like I'm wondering I don't know if you've had this is like off not even podcast but I'm wondering if there's like anything written on this like the you know, sort of like the WikiLeaks of, of, of the 1917, you know, like it was really kind of incredible that no one seems to really understand that also significance of mm -hmm. that they were able to hold this like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years of royal power and unlock all the secrets that were being, you know, kept there. I, I was I was just wondering if there was anything about that with especially with all these like, you know, secret agreements and things like that. Um, between imperialists, if you knew anything about it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Bolsheviks did uh, uh, expose uh, those uh, uh, hidden agreements, those uh, uh, Sykes-Pico uh, uh, agreements, and uh, well, they, uh, they, uh, yeah, in a way, uh, opened up uh, diplomacy uh, for the people. And uh, Ottomans at that time uh, uh, took advantage of it. I mean, the Ottoman Empire lost the war uh, on the side of Germany 
in the uh, in this uh, world war first world war uh, but the bolshevik uh, revolution in russia came uh, like uh, uh, un unpredicted help uh, for the ottomans but it also you know put an end to the uh, prison of uh, nations which Tsarist Russia was and um, people usually uh, do not recognize that it was uh, the Bolsheviks who uh, who uh, offered peace without reparations without annexations but imperialists uh, were not interested in them and German imperialism uh, wanted uh, to, uh, you know, uh, go further. They uh, supported Ukrainian nationalists, they supported uh, Georgian nationalists, and uh, they, uh, they were not interested uh, in the independence of nations, uh, but they were interested in uh, controlling them. Uh, because, you know, understandably, the, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution was a threat to all the existing order in all Europe. Uh, the ruling classes felt threatened by it. So they uh, they did what they could. Yeah, you know, it, at least in this part of the world, I think that it's very uncommon or, I guess, impossible, maybe we could even say, for the nationalisms uh, to admit that this period, their sovereignty, it, quote unquote sovereignty, relied on the, you know, patronage of various imperialisms. And I think this is a very important point that you bring up that is just, you know, the, the, the contemporary historiography refuses to engage with because it's the same reason why today, you know, in Georgia, if you critique the United States uh, or you critique the West, then they just say that you are promoting Russian disinformation, right? You are undermining, you know, uh, some, you know, Georgian sovereignty if you critique the West. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, in the case of Turkey, this is uh, more complicated because uh, on the one hand, Turkey fought against uh, all the powers of West, uh, like Britain and France. Uh, and, uh, but uh, in the Cold War after atmosphere, uh, after uh, the first, uh, after the Second World War, uh, these were uh, forgotten. Uh, I mean, uh, the, uh, there was this short lived uh, regional uh, Republic of Kars in Kars in 1919. Uh, this uh, whole borderland area, uh, the former uh, oblasts of Batum and Kars, including some uh, parts of the Erivan uh, gubernia, uh, at the end of the war, when Ottoman forces had to withdraw from the region, they left some agents, some uh, officers in disguise, uh, who set up uh, national Soviets uh, along uh, the line of the national Soviets in other parts of Caucasus, and they uh, set up a republic of or government of Southwest Caucasus. Now, this is interesting because they saw uh, the region as part of, I mean, uh, as ge geographically, as part of Caucasus, right? They called it Southwest Caucasus. But these days, this area is called Northeast Anatolia. So uh, it depends on the political situation, whether you are living in Southwest Caucasus or Northeast Anatolia. Uh, and this Republic was uh, practically uh, uh, closed or uh, finished uh, by the British forces. It wasn't uh, some uh, Russian forces, but British forces. 
But uh, Turkish historiography also doesn't want to, uh, you know, um, uh, accent, uh, make the accent on this. Uh, although in the post Soviet era, uh, there is now a new uh, uh, new situation, but this would, you know, uh, require a lot of time, I guess. Maybe we can talk about it later. Uh, how the yeah, how the post-Soviet situation, uh, you know, changed relations between Russia and Turkey, and uh, what are the new trends in Turkish historiography? Yeah, could be another topic. Yeah, I mean the maybe the that's another topic. Maybe we can wrap up, but you know, maybe one thing we could end on is, you know, one thing that's going on in Georgia in, in terms of like Georgia. Um, Georgia Turkey relations, you know, um, it's interesting how, you know, one element of the Georgian far right likes to say that, you know, Turkey is um, this is going to be this new imperial power into uh, Georgia and try to sort of capitalize off of that. And as you know, there were recently um, large, massive demonstrations because of Turkish investment in a hydroelectric dam project in Georgia. And, you know, obviously it was like the really amazing uh, social movement against this um, project, but also there were some people of the far right who was trying to take advantage of it to sort of, uh, you know, say that this Muslim invader of Turkey is trying to, you know, reconquer uh, a part of uh, Turkey or part of uh, Georgia again. And it's interesting how even in this uh, dynamic in Georgia, this tension between, you know, is the real imperialist Russia or is the real imperialist that's always in waiting uh, Turkey that wants to just like re-annex territories and take it back over. And so it was interesting to see how that sort of demonization of Turkey again was, was, was weaponized. Oh, by the way, I should uh, tell one thing more. Uh, you know, I uh, really wish uh, that uh, Georgian authorities uh, do not consider every researcher from Turkey as uh, an agent of Turkey or Turkish government. I mean, I am a, a free-minded uh, academic. I don't have any nationalist agenda. I am uh, friendly towards Georgian people. I mean, uh, who knows? Uh, this uh, in uh, yeah in my last uh, application I received a rejection from uh, the archives administration yes Georgian uh, state archives and I heard from other Turkish uh, researchers as well that uh, their you know uh, application for an uh, permit. Uh, of doing research in the archives on uh, topics related to Kars and Batum uh, were rejected. Uh, this is uh, rather worrying because, uh, I mean, obviously they state that uh, some part of the archive is in, uh, documents are in under restoration, but uh, I have difficulty how, I mean, all documents are uh, under restoration, uh, and I uh, sense uh, uh, some restrictionary policy uh, in this case. I hope this problem uh, will be solved because, uh, you know, if you are claiming to be a democratic uh, government, then you should open your archives. Look what Turkey does. I mean, uh, the I mean, you can accuse Turkey, but still it's, uh, the archives are open and uh, uh, Armenians can also do research in Turkish archives. You can even do uh, online research in Turkish archives. Uh, whether all documents are there uh, are open, it's another question, but still uh, so many documents are open to researchers. And uh, if uh, the Georgian uh, government wants to be at least as democratic as uh, the Turkish one, 
uh, administra- uh, in terms of archives. I mean, it should open the keep the archives open to researchers from Turkey as well. I hope uh, this problem uh, is uh, solved. Yeah.